We are continuing the same hadith, which was just a few days ago, not too long ago, so hopefully we can recall it. Again, starting from the beginning, um, أول ما بدي به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الوحي الرؤيا الصالحة في النوم. The beginning of the wahi came to Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم in the form of good dreams, which would come true like the bright daylight. فكان لا يرى رؤيا إلا جاءت مثل فرق الصبح. Whatever he would see would come true the next day like the morning. ثم حبب إليه الخلاء. Then he started enjoying to remain in seclusion. وَكَانَ يَخْلُوا بِغَارِ حِرَائٍ And he would adopt khalwa and remain in solitude in the cave of Hira. We talked about why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam chose this cave. It was not too far away from Mecca that it would be difficult to get there. Nor was it so near that he would be disturbed by the noise. Plus he would be able to see the Kaaba from this cave. And this was in ibadah of the previous Anbiya, the Sharia of Ismail bin Ibrahim alayhi salam and his grandfather used to worship Allah Ta'ala in this cave. What was the aqidah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prior to prophethood? What we know for sure is that all of the Anbiya alayhi salam they were divinely protected from committing all forms of major sin. Number one, the most major sin possible is shirk. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never committed shirk in the jahiliyyah before Islam or before his ba'atha, before he was granted prophethood. He still never committed shirk, nor did he commit any sin. And this word which is used in Urdu for an innocent person, they say masum bacha, masum. It actually comes from the verb isma. And isma means to protect. And the one who is the protector is the Asim. And the one who is protected is the Ma'asum. So these are forms of the word, the active participle and passive participle. Uh, active, the one who is doer and the one that it is done. So since we are learning the hadith in more depth, we can get used to these words. For example, you take any, any a common word would be Nasrun. Nasrun means to help. So these are names that we may be familiar with. Nasir, Nasir bhai or brother Nasir and brother Mansoor. So Nasir is the one who is the helper. Nasirun is the helper. And Mansoorun is the one who is helped. SubhanAllah. So Nasir is the one who's helping people, which is a good thing to be a helper. And Mansoor is the one who's helped, helped by Allah Ta'ala. He receives the help from Allah, Nasir and Mansoor. And for example, you, in Urdu you have the word katib. Katib is the one who is writing. So the one who is writing is katibun. And that which is written, apka maktub garami mosul hua, for example, I received your letter. Maktub is that which is written. Katib is the writer, maktub is that which is written. Akil, Akil is the one who is eating. Fajalahum kaasfin. Ma'kul. Ma'kul is that which is eaten. Another word in Urdu is used, for example, Qatil. Qatil is a killer. And the one who is killed is Maqtul. Qatil Maqtul. Nasir Mansur. So Asim is the protector. And Ma'asum is the one who is protected. The reason I'm going over this is so that we have a deeper appreciation for the word. Uh, when we say, oh, someone is masum, what does that mean? So we said, asimun is a protector, and masum is the one who is protected. So, Nuh salam, for example, when he is in the boat, and he is inviting his son to come onto the boat, and he says that, oh, my dear son, ya buniyar, kam ma'ana, oh, my dear son, jump onto the boat with us. And do not be amongst the losers, those who are going to drown in the flood. So the son says, Sa'awi ila jabal. 
I will go and take uh, protection refuge in the, the mountain top because I'm going to go to the top of the mountain and you know the flood will be on the lower areas and it's not going to reach the peak of the mountain. Ya'asimuni, so he used the same verb, Ismat, he will protect me. The top of the mountain, Ya'asimuni min al ma. I'll reach the top of the mountain and I'll be protected from the water. So then Nuh he responds to him and he says, Qala la asima al There is no asim today. No asim, la asim al min amrillah. There is no one who is going to protect you from the punishment of Allah today. Illa ma rahim. Unless Allah showers his mercy upon someone, he always left that. Uh, possibility open. Then an, uh, a wave came between them and overcame him, drowned him. So Asim is the protector. So Ma'asum is the one who is protected. Now what that means is, Subhanallah, this, the reason this is a, a beautiful word is because we already coming from the base understanding, oh Ma'asum is the one who is innocent. But when you say if someone is innocent, then you are attributing the fact that he is not committing the crime and the sins to himself. You'll say he is, wow, he is so great. He is so amazing. He is so righteous. He's so pious that he is protecting himself, staying away and abstaining from sins. So the end result that the person is innocent is what? His kamal, his perfection, because he is staying away from the sins. That's perhaps the meaning you take, oh, he's innocent, he's masum. Whereas if you understand masum, if you give the examples of maqtul, the one who was killed, ma'kul, the one who was eaten, mansur, the one who was helped, maktub, the one that was written, maqru, the one that is read, all of these. So in that same line, masum means, is that his act of abstaining from sins? or is now become the act of someone else. Someone else. Right? SubhanAllah. Whose act is it? Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Ma'asum doesn't mean he is the one who abstained from sins. Right? Do you understand? Ma'asum doesn't mean he abstained from sins. Ma'asum means he was protected. The, the one, the action is done by the Asim, the protector. Allah is the one who is Asim, the protector, and the Ma'asum is the one who is divinely protected. So this is from the linguistic approach to understand the meaning. Sometimes it may resonate with an individual, sometimes it may not. Then others, they may understand by seeing examples. So the example is, like Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the seerah, we know this famous story from the seerah, but now we connect it with this word. When he was young, there was a fair, right? There was a carnival. Do you remember? There was a carnival where all the different tribes are coming together. So they're going to have all kinds of activities and entertainment. So as a young man, he intended to also join, to go to the festival, Mela festival, where they were going to be, poets are going to sing their songs. Some will be good topics, some may not be the most appropriate topics. They may be dancing, they may be singing, they may be all kinds of activities. So as a young man, he intended to go. But then on the way, what happened? He fell asleep. He fell asleep, so deep sleep that he slept through the whole program. Then when he woke up, it was too late, he came back. So what is this example of? Divine protection, ma'asum. Likewise, Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran that Zulaikha ghallaqatil abwaba. She closed all the doors. So this was a type of construction which would be impossible to construct nowadays because it, it violates all the building codes. <laughs> because this is, there is no fire escape. So imagine there's a big hall, inside the hall, you open the door, go inside a hall, and inside the hall, there's another door. Then you go inside that door, there's another a hall within a hall. Then within that hall, there's another hall. Then you open the door, then within that hall, there's another hall. Within that hall, there's another hall. Within. So, there you are, go inside, inside, like circle, within a circle, another circle, another circle, another circle, uh, seven circles. So now you're all the way in the nucleus. So where you are stuck now from here to go out into, you know, to get a fire escape, you have to literally go through seven doors. That's, it's, it's very, very difficult to get out. You're not one or two doors away, you're seven doors away. 
Can you imagine such a construction? Right? Did you think about it? Just imagine a, a room. From you're inside a room, how claustrophobic it must be. If you want to get out of this room, you t open the door, you get out, and then you're another room. But from that room, you want to get out, another door. Then from that room, you want to get out, another door. Subhanallah. Allah Ta'ala says, غَلَّقَتِ abwab Abwab plural of? Bab. She closed all the doors. وَقَالَتْ هَيْ hey, Invited him to sin. قَالَ مَعَادُ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنْ مَثْوَى إِنَّهُ لَا يَفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا she had invited him towards evil and he would have intended to do the evil as well. Wahamma biha. Hammat, she had the wrong intention. Wahamma, he would have had as well. Lawla arra'a burhana rabbihi. Unless Allah Ta'ala did not show him the sign of his Lord. So he saw the burhana rabbi. Burhan is sign. Lawla arra'a burhana rabbi. And he would have, literally Allah Ta'ala says, he would have committed a sin too. Who would have? Yusuf Alayhi Salaam. لَوْلَا أَرْعَى بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ What was that sign? There are different opinions. There was an angel came or there was a sign of his father, Yaqub Alayhi Salaam, uh, who his image was shown to him and he was telling him no, no, with his hands. كَذَلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ سُوءَ وَالْفَحْشَاءَ So over here Allah Ta'ala Again, it's very important whenever there's a verb and a fi'al in the Qur'an to see that who is the actor, who is the subject of the verb, and who is the object of a verb. Just to remind ourselves, refresh, if there's any verb, any action, there's someone who is doing the action, and there's someone who is receiving the action. The one who is doing the action is known as the subject, and the one that is receiving the action is known as the object. So for example, if I'm helping you, then I'm the Nasir, the helper. You're Mansur, the one who is helped. So I'm the subject, you are the object. So if I'm drinking the water, I'm the drinker. The water is that which is being drunk. So over here, every time there is a verb, it's, it's very, very important to focus on who is the subject, who is the object. There are many, many lessons hidden in this throughout the Quran. Right from the beginning till the end. Right from Surah Al-Fatiha. إِهْذِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ O Allah, guide us along the straight path. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ The path of those people. أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ The path of those people that you honored them. It's not they deserved your honor. Rather, you honored them. And then, if it had to be parallel, symmetrical, it should have been غَيْرِ الَّذِينَ غَضَبْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Not the path of those people. You got angry at them. وَلَلَّذِينَ أَضْلَلْتَهُمْ Not the path of those people. You led them astray. Then it would be symmetrical. There's three groups, right? Surat al ladina anta alim, al maghdubi alim, al dalim. You see how the language switches over? When it's the path, when it's those, those that we're asking Allah Ta'ala guidance to follow their path, Surat al ladina and anta alim. O Allah, we ask from you to guide us along the straight path, the path of those you have honored them. It's not that they deserved it, rather, you honored them. And then غير المغضوب عليهم Not the path of those, they earned your anger. It's not you got angry at them, they earned your anger. والضالين Now are the path of those, they went astray. The reason I'm giving an example of Surah Fatiha is hopefully, I'm sure, not only, of course, 1000%, 100% we are, know the Surah, but I'm, I'm assuming we know the translation. So if you're aware of the translation, so one level of understanding you already past, then you can focus on the next level. But if you're still struggling to understand the translation, then it becomes too much to digest. So everyone knows the translation, I'm assuming, right? Fair enough for this dedicated crowd. Sirat al an'amta alim, the path of those of Allah, you favored them. So who are they? Nabiyin, Siddiqin, Shuhada, Salihin. But did they deserve the favor or you favored them? You favored them. Ghayr al alayhim, if you look in the translation, Open up anything from Yusuf Ali, Piktal, all the old ones and the new ones. It is also it's going. It should, inshallah, if they focus on this, the translator will uh, uh, show that غير المغضوب عليهم the path of those who have earned your anger. Or Piktal will say thine anger. <laughs> but ولا uh, ضالين those who have gone astray. Who went astray? They went astray. You don't say you you made them go astray, oh Allah. Allah Ta'ala says, مَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ حَسَنَةٍ 
Whenever any good comes to you, it is مِنَ Allah from Allah. And وَمَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ سَيِّئَةٍ Whatever evil befalls you, from in nafsik, you should attribute it to yourself. So this is the adab of how you speak. This is the adab of speaking. There are many more examples of this topic. But um, So whenever, whenever any good we have, we say, like when the mufti, he writes a fatwa, this is their standard template, all right? There's a standard decorum, etiquette, template of how you write a fatwa. So at the end, they always say, Wallahu a'lamu bisawab. Allah knows best and his knowledge is complete. And then they'll say different words, ilmu, atam, etc. But one of the words that they say is, in kana sawab famin Allah. If the answer is correct, it is from the guidance of Allah. وَإِنْ كَانَ الْخَطَاءَ If there is a mistake, فَمِنِّي وَمِنْ نَفْسِي وَمِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الْمَارِدِ If there is a mistake, it's from me, my nafs, and from shaitan. The usual three suspects. فَمِنِّي وَمِنْ نَفْسِي وَمِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الْمَارِدِ If there is any good, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Subhanallah. So all of these things, you know, there's just so much adab, so much etiquette in how, how to speak. Huh? Subhanallah. I was reading one book uh, that one, stu- one alim, great alim, he wrote, and he dedicated the book to his teacher. Allahu Akbar. And then on the front cover, he, he wrote one poem. So the poem itself is so beautiful, the meaning is so beautiful, but the etiquette, he made, he made a claim in his poem, and then he backed up his claim with a proof. So first he made a request. He made a request. He said, لا تنكرن إهداءنا لك منطقا من كستفدنا حسنه ونظامه فالله عز وجل يشكر في علما يتلو عليه وحيه وكتابه. He says, لا تنكرن, please, O oh my teacher, do not make inkar, do not reject. لا تنكرن, do not reject. لا تنكرن إهداءنا, my gift to you. I'm giving, gifting this book, right? He's dedicating the book to his teacher. He says, لا تنكرن, Do not reject إهداءنا, This hadiya, this gift I'm giving you منطقن, Of such a speech, of such a kalam Such a book, such words Now the thing is He's requesting Please do not reject the gift I'm giving you Now but the one who is gifter And the one who's receiving the gift Who is the higher status? The gifter The upper hand is higher than the lower hand But he's gifting it to whom? His young son or a student or to his teacher? It's his teacher. So now he's giving the gift, so he's on the upper hand, but now he's making his teacher the lower hand. That's not a good thing. So he has to switch it around. So then he says, Min kastafadana husnahu wa nidamahu. Whatever beauty, whatever perfection, whatever excellence is in this book, it, it has been acquired through your efforts. He said that. Now the thing is, then there's a problem with that. The problem is if all the excellence and the perfection in the beauty in the book you, that you have compiled, it came from me, then what's the point? Why do I need it? Because I already have it. So why should I accept it? What's the need for, in it for me? So he has to give an evidence. The proof he gives, فَاللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ See, he says, oh look, that Allah Azza wa Jal yashkuru. He gratefully, uh, he graciously accepts يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِ وَحْيَهُ وَكَلَامَهُ The one who recites unto Allah his own wahi and kalam. So when you make dilawa to, of the Qur'an, the kalam of Allah to Allah, are you increasing the knowledge of Allah? You're teaching him something he didn't know? So when you recite in the Qur'an to Allah, what does Allah do? He says, oh, I already knew this, I don't need to hear this. Or does he accept it and he rewards you? Subhanallah. So it's, huh? So he says that, Oh my dear teacher, please do not reject the gift of this book that I'm presenting to you, dedicating to you. The beauty and excellence of this book, I received it from you. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the tilaw of the one who recites unto him his kalam. Subhanallah. Anyway, the point is that ma'asum means divinely protected. All the anbiya alayhi wa they not only abstain from sins, even if they wanted to commit sins, they are protected. And the Nabi alayhi salam, he never committed any sin, shirk uh, for sure, and uh, any other sin. Ma'asum min al sagair wal kabair. Major sins and minor sins. Qabl al nabu'a ba'daha, both prior to and after prophethood. Because this goes against the dictate of being an example. It's a very, very logical thing. 
if the Nabi is an individual whose every action is an example for the entire Ummah to follow till the Day of Judgment, then how could he be committing sins? On top of it, it is proven in the Quran, مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍّ أَنْ يَغُلَّ وَمَنْ يَغْلُ الْيَأْتِ بِمَا غُلَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ No sin, no Nabi of Allah will commit any khiyana and any sin. If there are any such decisions they made which were uh, contrary to the best course of action destined by Allah Ta'ala or decreed by Allah Ta'ala, Allah would have corrected them as well. So that their final amal would be such pleasing to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now, uh, what deen they were on? They were on the deen al-fitrah, the natural deen. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, Kullum, uh, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, fitrat Allah allati fataran nasa alayha. There is a natural disposition that Allah Ta'ala creates in His creation. So when they are born, they are born with this fitrah. It is so sad that all the children are born with this fitrah and then the environment is that which corrupts them. Rasulullah explained this hadith very explicitly and he said, Kullu mauludin, every child that is born, yuladu ala al fitrah, is born with the natural fitrah, natural way of recognizing one Allah. This is naturally um, programmed, they are programmed that way, to believe in a creator. كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِتْرَةِ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُحَوِّذَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ Then the parents, sometimes they turn him into a Yehudi, a Jew, or يُنَصِّرَانِهِ or a Christian, or يُمَجِّسَانِهِ or a fire worshiper. But the original disposition, the way Allah has created, is to believe in one Allah. As far as um, the Sharia, was he mukallaf of any Sharia? The best course of action is we should make tawaqquf. Tawaqquf is to remain silent on this matter. Meaning we do not make any decision. Why? Because the sharia is sakit. Sakit means it's quiet regarding it. Does not mention uh, what his particular sharia he would follow. Others say that it was the sharia of Ismail alayhi salam. Some of the ahkam injunctions had carried on till his time. Um, the reason this whole discussion, and there's a lot of things beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about, comes here is because of this word that he was worshipping uh, in, the, in the cave. So that's why there's a whole discussion. What type of worship was it? What type of belief was it? This is where this is coming into play. Um, one thing that is known is that it was uh, contemplation, meditation, and dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a common factor we find in all of the different uh, interpretations and over here if you see in the Arabic it says so this is something that happens many times where if there's a word in the Arabic which is not as common then it is explained and this explanation is done sometimes by the later narrators in the Sanat so um, this, was a, this is describing a specific form of worship Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do in the cave. And then this says, And that is a form of ibadah. This is explaining the word tahannuf. This is later in the Sanad. We have Ibn Shahab Budin Zuhri. This Ibn Shahab Zuhri, these are his words. And this explanation that is added, the scholars of Hadith, they identify who added these words. When did they add it? And this is, uh, has its own term, which is it's called idraj and this mudraj. But beyond the scope of our understanding, but all I want to show is that sometimes even within the Arabic, if there are some explanatory words which were added, which were not part of the original narration, those are always identified. So Ibn Shahabuddin Dhuhri, Rahmatullahi, Imam Muhaddithin in Medina, Tabi'i, he, he added this, he explained, wa huwa ta'bud. This is a specific form of ibadah that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do. This happens in the nights, Al-Layali. So, Al-Layali, was he worshipping only in the nights, not in the day? He's worshipping in the day as well. So, so the nights and the day. Sometimes it's just the night is mentioned, it means the night and day. Sometimes the day is mentioned, it means the night and day. Sometimes it only means night, sometimes it only means day. But over here it means, the question would come that, oh, maybe perhaps he's worshipping in the day and then he goes home at night. So that's why the night was specified. Um, 
and qabla an yanzi'a ila ahlihi now coming to here qabla an yanzi'a ila ahlihi before he uh, before he had the desire to return back to his home see it says here in english he used to worship allah alone continuously for many days before his desire to see his family qabla an yanzi'a ila ahlihi so the desire to see the family there is a discussion here as well as we can see every word will have discussion right so the the discussion here is that having a desire to see the family what is the concept regarding that so what we know is that in our deen our deen is a very natural deen deen of fitrah and this this way of taking vows of celibacy if not of get, not to get married this was something that the Christians came up with. Allah Ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Hadid, وَرَهْبَانِيَّةِ رَهْبَانِيَّةِ Ascetic way of life, of saying, taking vows of celibacy, not getting married. The monks would not get married, they were the males, and the nuns are the females. The nuns would never get married to men, the monks would never get married to women. They would lead their lives originally in solitude, and other times committing all kinds of other uh, impermissible things. But not getting married, right? So this thing, is khilaf of our deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَهْبَانِيَّةً اِبْتَدَعُوهَا Surah Al-Hadid, this is an innovation they came up with. مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلِهِمْ I did not make that an obligation upon them. I never told them to do this. Isa alayhi salam, yes, he never got married because he was uplifted. Right? At the age of 33, he would potentially get married, but he was taken up too fast. So he didn't have any concept against marriage. The general sunnah of all of the Anbiya Ali Muslim was to get married. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ We have sent all these messengers prior to you. وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَذُرِّيَّةً They all had wives and children. And um, the exception is Isa alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam. Yahya alayhi salam also he was shaheed, very young. This was the mahar that a woman asked her lover, if you want to marry me then I need the head of. Na'udhu Billah, Yahya alayhi salam. So he was beheaded by this man in the love of a woman. And this is, um, subhanAllah, that was a big test. And he failed in that test. So he was, he was also uh, unmarried. When he got the Bashara, Zakari alayhi salam, the Bashara itself says, Mubashiruka bi Yahya, we give you the Bashara of Yahya alayhi salam. Nabiyan or Hasuran min al-Salihin. Hasur, he will, he will be uh, unmarried and he will be a righteous, pious man. So Yahya alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam did not get married. Otherwise, all the Anbiya alayhi salam got married. So taking this vows of celibacy and not getting married, this is khilaf of sharia, hikmah and fitrah. How is it khilaf of sharia? Because the sharia gives us many, many ahkam, injunctions and encouragement to get married with the correct intention. An nikah min sunnati. Nikah is from the sunnah of, uh, of, of Rasulullah the sunnah of all the Anbiya and for that matter. And there are hadith where Nabi Sallallahu said, Ya ma'ashara shabab, man istata'a min kawal ba'ata fal yitazawwaj, O young men, whoever is able to marry should get married. Fa'innahu aghaddu lil basar, it will help to guard your gaze and will protect you. So this is uh, what the sharia says. So not getting married is against the sharia if a person has the ability to do so. There is this debate that if a person says that I will not get married because uh, two people, one side you have a person who gets married and fulfills the responsibilities of marriage versus a person who abstains from marriage with not because of financial constraint, not because of physical constraint, solely because he wants to engage in more ibadah. So this is called at uh, lil ibadah. The one who remains single, that whatever time goes into taking care of the wife, whatever time goes into taking care of kids, all of that time I will engage in nafal ibadah. So which one is more rewarding? The one who engages in more nafal ibadah or the one who does fulfill his faraid and obligations and nawafil and everything, but sometime also definitely has to go and take care of wife and kids. So the... Um, Imam Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, the Fuqaha of Hanafiya, according to them, that Ishtigal bin Nikah awla min at lil ibadah. Meaning, engaging in Nikah and all of the responsibilities of that is actually more rewarding than remaining 
in solitude and alone for the sake of ibadah. Because this is all also forms of ibadah. It is the frame of mind that we have to have. We talked about this in detail under innamal a'malu bid niyad. Remember? It's been a while before Ramadan break came. Innamal a'malu bid niyad. So, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا Human beings and jinn have not been created but for the ibadah of Allah. So if somebody asks, does that mean all day, all night, as soon as you open your eyes, you stand in qiyam, in salah, until you go to sleep, you're in salah, in sajda, ruku, that's it. Is that what it means? Ibadah meaning, there are two forms of ibadah. Primary ibadah and secondary ibadah. Ibadah li'aynihi, ibadah li'aynihi. So you are fluctuating between the two, never any third option. Either you're engaged in primary ibadah, which is salah, dua, dhikr, tilawa, ta'allum, da'wah. These are all primary forms of ibadah. And when you take a break from primary form of ibadah, what do you engage in? Secondary. Secondary form of ibadah is preparing for the primary. Whether it comes sleeping, eating, even, my dear say, relaxing. And entertainment, halal entertainment, relaxing by oneself, taking, you know, it's not only about with the wife and kids. Even if a person takes a walk in the park, that is an ibadah. When is it ibadah? If the innamal amal bin niyat part is there, if the niyah of the walk in the park literally is so I can clear my mind and I can focus and I can worship Allah better, who is making that niyah? Wa qalilu mahum. Very few indeed are, frankly. So, so if a person is subhanallah you know like the famous hadith even the luqma a morsel of food you place in the mouth of your wife is ibadah but when is it ibadah when is it sadaqah if the niyyah is proper otherwise it's not a sadaqah there's no reward in it subhanallah so ibadah is لِعَيْنِهِ and لِغَيْرِهِ Primary and secondary. There's no third option. Because the niyyah is always there. And every moment, a mu'min is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, rahbaniyyah is khilaf of sharia. And it's khilaf, number one. Number two is khilaf of hikmah. It's contrary to hikmah. How is it contrary to hikmah? Because if marriage will not happen, there will be no uh, uh, lineage maintained and the humanity will cease to exist on earth. So it's, it's very obviously the end of the human population will happen. That's khilaf of hikmat. Number three is khilaf of fitrah. Fitrah means the natural way Allah has created us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created natural needs within us and this is the halal way of fulfilling those needs. So all of that is discussed by the scholars under this word that yanzi'a ila ahlihi then before his desire to see his family. There are examples of this where there was the waft of Abdul Qais. The waft of Abdul Qais was a group of delegation of young Sahaba who came from the Abdul Qais tribe. They had accepted Islam because one of the, the Sahaba had reached their area. They had accepted Islam. Then they came. Kunna Shababa. We were young men. And we came to visit Rasulullah wasallam. They stayed for a couple of days in the company of Nabi wasallam. That was the first time they saw him in Medina. And that was the last time because they went back to their area. And afterwards they heard Rasulullah passed away. So they rushed in and they came in running with their camels and they all jumped off their camels and rushed into the masjid. But then their Amir, what did he do? He got off. Then he took off all of the luggage from the camels because the camels are holding the luggage, carrying the luggage. Then he tied them properly, made them sit down, took care of them, took off all his stuff. He was very excited to see Nabi Wasallam too, but he took care of everyone. Then he went inside. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw him and he said that Sayyidul Qawmi fi safari khadimuhum. The true leader of the people in the journey is their khadim, the servant. And then he said, Inna fika khaslatayn. Verily you have two qualities. Yuhibbuhum Allahu Rasulu. That Allah and His Rasul love. Al-hilmu. You are forbearing and you have tadbir and you do things in a methodological manner with, with order. You're not just you know, emotionally driven, you're a very rational person, and that's because he took care of everything. The second thing is he didn't get mad at anyone else. So that's why that's the halim part, halim, means forbearing, patient. Anyway, the, the reason I mention the story is that there's back and forth, they learn things. There are different ahadiths that come about the waft Abdul Qais. 
But at the end, they say that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw ishtaqna ahlana, that we were missing our wives and children. So he said that, okay, you have been away so many days, you must be missing your family so you can go back. So then, because we are young sahaba, he said, oh, you are missing your families, go back. And he sent them. So this was the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. Then next word is, وَيَتَزَوَّدُوا لِذَلِكَ When he would go home, he would prepare his zad, which is her provisions. It says here, take his food likewise again. وَيَتَزَوَّدُوا لِذَلِكَ He would prepare his food. So this is an, another lesson too. That Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he goes home, he prepares his lunch and provisions to go back to the cave. So adopting means and asbab and saving for the future, this is not against the wakul. It doesn't mean that if a person um, preserves some assets for himself, for his children, for family, for the future, this means that this person does not have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This was a specific approach of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu, he, he, he had that opinion that you're not allowed to save anything. And if you do that, that's haram. I'm not sure if who was here, who was not here in Ramadan. We talked about his story in Ramadan. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu, that he had this opinion, what happened to him in Damascus. And he was going around preaching this. And then Uthman radiallahu anhu had to send him into exile. Right. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu had that opinion. But we see that the vast majority of the ummah does not have that opinion. All the sahaba did not have that opinion. The fuqaha and the Rasulullah's practice as well. So, um, having tadbir, saving things. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, for the azwaj mutaharat, he would give them, each one, the ration of all of their needs for the entire year. This is all your flour, this is all your uh, you know, oil, what, everything, dates, everything you need for the whole year. Now, the reason that they would end up having uh, um, hunger is because they would end up giving it out in sadaqah. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would give them. So the reality of, tak- of tawakkul is not tarkul asbab, leaving the asbab, but rather making the plans and making the tadbir, but not relying on the plans. The most famous hadith regarding this is of course the i'aqalha wa tawakkal ala Allah. Tie the camel and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it's very, very, very tricky situation. Because what gets excited and we get happy, or like, oh, tying, tie the camel. But at the end of the day, we really are trusting in that, in the tying. Are we truly trusting in Allah or not? That's the question. If the, if the test was that, okay, you truly trust in Allah and the camel is not going to move, then it would actually in a way be easier. Because if you trusted, you would see the result right away. Why is it tricky? It's because you are adopting the means, but you're not trusting in the means. But you see the means looks like it's doing its work. Whereas you have to believe that it is Allah behind the scenes who is actually protecting it. And the litmus test is, how you determine that, is that if Allah Ta'ala wants, He can protect without the means. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, if He decides, then with the means as well, there will be no protection. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is not limited to the means. And do you remember the hadith about the birds? Huh? You remember? Okay. We covered it in this dars or in Ramadan? In Ramadan. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a hadith that people misquote. لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ If you would have tawakkul on Allah, the way it is the right of Allah that you have tawakkul upon Him, لَرَزَغَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزَغُ الطَّيِّرِ then he would provide provision for you the way he provi- provides provision for the birds. Taghdu khimasan, they leave their nest in the morning with empty bellies. Wataruhu bitana, and they return home with full stomach. I remember mentioning it here in this class. He did, okay, yeah. So the key here is they would be leaving their nest. So that means why are they leaving their nest? To seek the risk. So they are doing the effort 
and then Allah is providing them. But people say, look, <laughs> now, yeah, I don't want to repeat what is said, okay. Then what happened? He was taking his provision. He would go back to Khadijah. He prepares the provision. Until one day, the truth, haq came to him. Al jaahu came to him. Al haq, the haq. What is haq? One is al haq means amrul haq, the true matter came to him, or the Rasulul haq, the messenger of truth, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him. So in other words, Jibreel alayhi salam came. We know Jibreel alayhi salam came. Wahu fi qadi hira. While he was still in the cave, the fajaahu al malak, the queen, the the angel came, faqal, and he said, Iqra, read. Angel Jibreel came and said, Iqra, read. It's a command. Qala ma ana He said, I cannot read. I'm not ready to read. Or I'm not, I'm not able to read. I do not know how to read. So not knowing how to read, is, is, in general, this is not a good quality. This is not a good trait because knowledge is something beneficial. Knowledge is something prized. Knowledge is something encouraged in our deen. And there's so many ahadith about the virtues of learning how to read and write. This is unique with Rasulullah that only with respect to his person, it was actually a praiseworthy quality because of specific circumstances. Two of them are the very major ones. Number one is no matter how great a person becomes later on in life and how he advances, at the end of the day, the initial teacher who taught him the A, B, C's, Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, 1, 2, 3, 4, can always have an upper hand over the individual and say that you became so great, you achieved the Nobel Prize and this and that, but you began your journey of knowledge under my tutelage. So there is supposed to be a level of respect for the, for the teacher and they can lay a claim to the greatness that follows. Whereas with respect to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no human being who taught him reading and writing. No one can claim that, you know, this is the education I give him. Because he said, Addabani Rabbi fa'ahsanata adibi, allabani Rabbi fa'ahsanata alimi. My Lord, Allah, He's the one who educated me directly and He gave me the best education. And He is the one who taught me adab and etiquettes and He taught me the best etiquettes. Second, reason is very explicitly mentioned in the Quran itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he addresses Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that la takhutuhu bi yaminik you do not write you do not write with your hand idha lartabal mubtilun so those who wanted to cast doubt on the veracity of this book that it is the authentic revealed word of Allah, they would have an opportunity to do so. They could say that oh you're reading, you, you read up from different scriptures here and there and then you you created your own false religion so na'udhu billah no one is able to say that why are they not able to say that because he was not reading and he did not have uh, access to any other scriptures so with respect to rasulullah not being able to read was a it was a specific was a specific attribute that is why he's known as an nabiyul ummi Ummi. So Ummun is mother and Ya is a Ya of Nisbah. So it means, literally it means the one who belongs to the mother. So you add this Ya, it means the Ya of belonging. Ya of Nisbah, belonging. So Makkiyun belongs to Makkah. Madaniyun belongs to Medina. And Hindiyun and Amerikiyun and Pakistaniyun, Iraqiyun, Misriyun belongs to all of those respective countries. So Ummiyun, the one who belongs to the mother. Why does he belong to the mother? You'll see if you all belong to the mother. Yes, but the one who belongs to the mother means that when the mother uh, gave birth to the baby, the way he was in the original state. What was the state? He was not born with any degrees. He did not know how to read and write. Allah Ta'ala says, أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ He brought you forth from the wombs of your mothers. لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا You did not know anything. So he remains in that natural condition. Now the question comes and he says, that one question is Faja'ahul Malak, the angel came to him. Faja'ahul Malak, the angel came. Did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know that this was an angel at this point? Was he already aware who he was or not? If he wasn't, 
then how is he saying Faja'ahu al-Malak? Simple answer, Imam Ismaili rahmatullahi he gives is that um, if you meet someone and you had an incident, exchange, this and that, later on you get to know the name of that individual. So now when you're narrating the story, when you go back and say the first meeting, this happened, that happened, even before you learn the name of the individual, but now you're narrating it afterwards, you will take the name of that individual. So when they go to uh, Waraka ibn, ibn Nawfal and he explains to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this was the angel Jibreel that came to you, the same one that came to Musa Alaihi Wasallam. So now Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew who it was. So therefore when he's narrating it, he is using the word Malak. Simple as that. Others have given the answer, Siraj al Balqini, is that perhaps Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remembered that when he was in his childhood, how Jibreel alayhi salam came to him. So he, he, he recognized it that way. Wallahu alam. Now, when did this happen? We know that the month. This happened in the month of Ramadan. Because this is when the revelation of the Quran began. Shah Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. How old was Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam when this incident happened? 40 years of age. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 40 years of age, then he had the 23 years of prophethood, and then his final, uh, he returned to Allah at the age of 63. Now we come to this word, Faqala Iqra, I asked him to read. Um, so there's a, there's a number of questions here. One is that there's, if Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cannot read, then why is Jibreel Alaihi asking him to read? Isn't this something which is known as taklif ma'ala yutaq? Meaning obligating someone to do something which is impossible for him to do. So for example, if so, it is impossible for somebody to do, uh, fulfill a command, if Allah Ta'ala would not make us oblig uh, in, uh, an obligation for us. Allah Ta'ala says that, okay, fast from this time to this time. But if somebody is unable to fast, and someone is sick, Allah says, fine, you can fast later. What is a general ayah about this? La yukallifullahu nafsan la wasaha. Allah does not obligate anyone to do something which they are unable to do. So if he was unable to read, then why is Allah Ta'ala saying Jibreel Alayhi Salaam to tell him read when he can't read? That's the question. So the answer is, Iqra, this is an Amr, there's two types of Amr. One is Amr taklifi, one is Amr talqini. Amr taklifi means that you are obligated. And Amr Talqini is that he is an Amr command to encourage. Just like when the teacher is teaching the student, he says, okay, read, read the qaida, and then he starts saying, alif, ba, ta, ta. So he is indicating for him to follow along what will be coming next. Right? So th this is one understanding. When, when Jibreel al -Islam is telling him, Iqra, he is not giving him some passage that is he has to decipher and figure it out and be able to read it he's just saying okay read as well for what, what I'm going to be saying next you need to repeat after me this is called Amr Talqini and I even um, in, in, in this case if he said Iqra follow after me and then what does the, uh, imam, uh, the teacher do he says Alif Ba Ta Tha so if he said Iqra read after me and then after that he says Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen or if he taught some other surah, it would make sense. But he doesn't. The actual revelation that happens after these words is what? Iqra bismi rabbika. It's actually the same words. That is why if you go even deeper, the second response even makes even more sense. Which is the explanation of Allama Bilqini rahmatullahi. He says that when, Nabi, when Jibreel alayhi salam was saying Iqra, he wasn't actually telling him to read. Rather, he was telling him to what? Repeat what I'm saying. Because if you look at the first words of the first revelation, it is what? Iqra bismi rabbika allavi khala. So when he says Iqra, he just was saying, repeat after him, uh, re repeat the same thing. Just like when you give shahada to someone, you say, Ashhadu. So then say, Ashhadu. Allah, Allah, ilaha, ilaha. So he's, he's teaching, he's saying, Iqra means. Up till now, we always thought he's saying, read. Then he's saying, oh. no, he's literally saying, repeat the same word. So, then the response would be like, wait a second. Why couldn't he just say, قُلْ 
اقرأ say اقرأ then that would become more confusing why would it become confusing because you have قل هو الله واحد قل أعوذ برب الفلق قل أعوذ برب الناس then it would become قل اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق سبحان الله because قل means say so this is this is how, this is أعوذ بالله من ذلك in this modern in this recent times there were so many different tyrant kings so you had نعوذ بالله we talked about حافظ الأسد and Bashar al-Assad and Mubarak and all of the Saddam Hussein and all these different despots who came. But one of them that was Muammar Qaddafi who was very unique is that all of them they just committed the zulm atrocities and killed people but he also interfered in the deen. He came up with some crazy different ideologies. So his aqaid were so whacked out that unbelievable crazy things. Like The thing is when they're committing these atrocities from a worldly dunyavi uh, greedy perspective, it kind of makes sense. Why? It makes sense that they could care less about other people's lives. They care about what? Power, wealth. Okay, that's why they're killing their opponents. But why, why does it make any difference to come up with crazy religious ideas? One of them, Muammar Qaddafi said, is that when Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Qul, say, huwa Allah wahad, that was a command from Allah to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah ta- commanded him, Qul, say. He already said it. So why are you repeating it? Na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah. Rejecting one ayah of the Qur'an, one word of the Qur'an is kufr. So he, he came up with his own Qur'an. And he used to say, don't say qul huwa Allah Say, huwa Allah wahad. A'udhu bi rabbil falaq, a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Get rid of the qul. This was the ideology, amongst many other crazy ideologies of Muammar Qaddafi. Allah Akbar. Muammar Qaddafi, you may have heard, was the ruler of Libya, exactly. So that's why when he said Iqra, read, then he just wanted Rasulullah to repeat after him. And Hafiz ibn Hajar Asqalani, the commentary of Sayyid Bukhari in Fatul Bari, he says that uh, another benefit of not saying Qul, repeat after me, is because of the confusion. This and and, and Rasulullah saying, Ma'ana Bukhari, no, I can't do that. All he had to do was what? Repeat the words. And he said, no, he was not, he didn't understand right away. He said, no, I cannot read. Because of the confusion, Jibreel alayhi salam had an opportunity to tightly embrace him three times. And there are many, many different wisdoms and hikma, hikam behind why he was embraced three times. And the reason the embrace happened three times is because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi did not immediately at first glance at the first instance understand that all he had to do was repeat the same words so that was an objective of its own from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this process of the three tight embraces to occur which is following right after this so he then grabbed me Embraced me tightly until he caused me pain. Then he released me. Second time. He said, just all you had to do was repeat the iqra. I said, no, I cannot. Second time, he grabbed me tight and tightly uh, embraced me. And then he said, iqra. Second time. فأخذني فغتني أثالسا he grabbed me and embraced me the third time ثم أرسلني released me فقال and then he said اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق so inshallah in the next session coming Monday بإذن الله تعالى we want to start from here because this is a, a very a long discussion about the different wisdoms behind why he was embraced three times if we can recall where we are right now at this point so it'll be easy to start we're going to start right from the point of why was he embraced three times? What are the lessons there? What exactly was happening? I give some indication toward this. It's like <laughs> how the, the um, resuscitation occurs when um, the electric shock is given to the heart to get it beating. So th- wh- how did this resuscitation occur three times? And what are some of the beautiful points the mashayikh of Tazkiyah and Ilm both combine here and give amazing different lessons? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revive our dead hearts as well. And allow us to gain the barakat of this wahi. 
this way of which began with Iqra, Bismi Rabbika, Ladi Khalaq, Khalaq al Insan, Amin Alaq, Iqra, or Abuk al Akram, Al Ladi Alam, Bil Kalam, Alam al Insan, Amalam Yalam, and some of the knowledge that is uh, um, hidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq to explain and understand and bring it to practice. Wa akhir da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alayhi. Jazakumullah.